Well, thank you very much for joining us for another ICMI. Here we have uh, a QA and a with Stuart Graham in the UK. Uh, so Natalie, everybody knows well. Stuart, would you like to introduce yourself? I am Stuart Graham. I've spent 16 years myself in the UK family courts. I was recently uh, an expert witness. I've studied along the way um, and I've just completed what seems to be the first extensive uh, professional grade course for professionals on parental alienation, which is available online as an open access course. I think that's all I need to say about me. No worries. So uh, we've actually had a number of videos in ICMI this year about parental alienation. So we've had uh, a video by Jan James, a video by Amanda Sillers, uh, who you may know who's in Australia. Actually, Amanda doesn't actually live that far from me. So we actually meet up in person quite a bit and, you know, have a coffee and so and so forth. Uh, but Amanda runs um, the Eeny Meeny Miny Mo Foundation, which is an organisation here, which is uh, getting, getting, Thank trying you. to get better recognition, of, recognition that parental alienation exists, which is something that that uh, is, is widely resisted in the in the Australian government and courts. And uh, basically, yeah, so getting getting knowledge of it out there. Uh, and uh, coming up tomorrow, we have a presentation by Jan and uh, Amanda as well. Actually, where we were able to get them both together, yeah. so sort of, we we organise that sort of uh, ad hoc. So, but uh, thank you very much for joining us for the Q&A. If anyone has any questions, uh, they're welcome to put them now. Otherwise, we will, we will kick off. So, um, yes, so the, your, your presentation really covered a lot of material and you talked about uh, a number of different countries and really, I guess, the aim was to compare, in many cases, the, the other jurisdictions to what you were experiencing in the UK. One area that I thought was uh, interesting was that you spent quite a, quite a while talking about Israel, and it, it did seem that you were um, really painting quite a favourable picture of Israel towards the UK. So I'm wondering if you if you could expand on that a little bit in terms of uh, do you think that the Israelis have have done a, a, a decent job of of, of framing or building the system? Or um, certainly in theory, because of the. Um the section of the course there that I, I, I donated is uh, it, it's built on the papers written by a judge called Philip Marcus. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's only on the papers. I am planning to go to Israel next year to see uh, exactly how that system does operate. But they brought it in in 1995 mm -hmm. and they've either kept quiet about it or all the papers that have been written about it have been written in Hebrew. Yeah. And it wasn't until Philip Marcus wrote something a couple of years ago uh, explaining the therapeutic ju jurisdiction that they introduced a long time ago in Israel uh, that anybody else really started to pick up on it. And I don't think that it, it's widely enough known, which is why I plug his uh, work mm. quite a lot. Um, but they got rid of the family law justice system because they realized, or the adversarial system, I should say, because they realized that it brings its own inimical uh, and uh, iatrogenic harm mm. to families. Uh, forensic stress is an extremely uh, heavy kind of stress for anybody to be going through. Mm. Uh, and the stress reports that have been done, the research has been done, has always been done on criminal and civil mm -hmm. um, research. And going through family court, as anybody would know, mm -hmm. uh, is a far greater stress than I, I think either of those two. Mm -hmm. So um, they found that it was just causing more harm. It wasn't doing much good. It wasn't really helping the families. Mm -hmm. So, and they realized as well, of course, as, as many other psychologists have found, that um, most of the problems that we find in even private family courts are down to mental health mm. so they pulled in mental health teams social mm. workers who are mental health highly trained in the, uh, they're not just social workers but also highly trained mental health practitioners and specialists in this particular area mm. which is very important same for the psychologists mm. and over time the teams have taken on more and more work they now look after the mediation they assess the cases before it even goes to court Mm. You don't actually apply to go to court in Israel. You apply for an assessment by the team. And mm. only if the team considers that you need to go to court, will you actually go there? Well, at least you'll go to the first hearing with a very good, with a judge having a very good understanding. And the judges 
are plugged into these teams as well because they have to do residential, so they actually have to go away and study with these teams a couple mm. of times a year. Mm. So um, the system seems, in theory, at least, to be working to be a, a very well set up, very well thought out, very compassionate system, and um, we need to find out how it's been going. The satisfaction rates we do know are around 70 to 80 percent satisfaction which is a completely re complete the, the reverse of what we seem to have in the, in the uk so it's not going to be pleasing everybody but uh, you know it certainly seems to have a far better uh, public opinion about the court system than, than here yeah so i know that uh, you said you don't really have much knowledge of the australian experience i'm of course living in australia uh, when when you talked about the uh, the Israelis having a mediation process, it actually reminded me of some things that that do go on here, where there's where there are, is, a, is a mandatory uh, attempt at mediation before going to court. I don't have any hard data. My, my suspicion is that people here probably aren't as happy with the process as perhaps the Israelis mm -hmm. are sounding like they might be. Uh, so yeah, I don't know if you've had any experience or knowledge of the Australian mediation process. Uh, no, but I can imagine it's the same as here, because it seems to be that all these adversarial common law systems working together, I don't think they're working for the benefit of the families, to be quite frank. I think they're working for the benefit of the professionals. Yes. Um, and where mediation is concerned, certainly in the UK, um, is with the more problematic cases, it only adds to the pain of those families by building in more delays at what is probably the most delicate point at the beginning where alienation is beginning to set in yes. and so by the time you actually get to court you have a very much worse system than you would have had a first worst situation than you would have had uh, had mediation not been there and there are some so many get arounds that people don't have to go to mediation that um it just doesn't work i mean the the uh, arrangements of the maiden's mediation are not legally enforceable. Um, it build, builds in delay in the, in, in the worst cases. Mm. And um, uh, it's been shown that it just doesn't work. It's, it's raised the amount of allegations being used to get non-molestation orders uh, because the whole system changed at the same time. You can now only get legal aid if you have a non-molestation order and if you have a non-molestation order, you don't have to go to mediation. So we're finding that the, the 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 legal business that was lost through mediation has actually more or less doubled through getting around the mediation with non-molestation orders. Um, and the problem with the orders is that many of them are issued ex parte without notice, yeah. where evidence is not uh, looked at. Um, it's heard, but it's not looked at. Um, that gets the legal aid going and we find that once the lawyers are involved, especially with the more intractable cases, that they just last forever. And they very rarely end up with any kind of proper resolution with the children actually getting a, a meaningful amount of time with whatever parent is the separated parent, be it the mother or the father. Mm. And that really sounds like it's incentivizing the orders, actually, that if there are there are material benefits from making an allegation and getting one of these orders put in, and then you're suggesting is putting out their, 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 their established ex parte, which means that the person isn't even there in court. Yeah, there was a, a, a there is an article on a BuzzFeed news news website where they uncovered a massive scam from the National Centre of Domestic Violence who were effectively taking backhanders from legal firms. Um, they had become, they were a charity to start with, they became the referral uh, agency for the police and every time uh, somebody met particular criteria that would probably qualify them for a non-molestation order issued ex parte, yep. um, then any legal firms that signed up and paid for their subscription to the NCDC got the work and the NCDC were then getting effectively backhanders, something like 10% of the legal aid money that was going to those firms. Um, and one of the firms was uh, sanctioned nowhere near enough, in my, my opinion, for what was, you know, this bulk scam that they were uh, perpetrating through the family courts.
That's even much, much worse than anything I've even heard of here in Australia. That's that is absolutely extraordinary. And have they have they managed? Have they shut down shut down that, that what's going on there, or is that still going on? Um, I, I I think the same sort of thing is happening. I don't believe that there are um, open handed arrangements like that going on anymore. But it just seems to me that the the rise in non molestation orders, the 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 rate at which they are issued. Um, the fact that judiciary have actually been told not to stop issuing orders, they shouldn't have to be told. Mm. Um, in many of the cases that I've seen, um, the actual allegations that are used to, to get that particular order at the beginning are never actually adjudicated at court, uh, and yet the legal aid remains during the lifespan of the um, family court case. Um, so, because issues then move on to uh, child contact and and then the, the, you know the, it, it may well be that no fact finding ever happens mm. um the fact finding is supposed to happen if you look at israel mm. the the law the legislation was drafted in such a way as to compel judges to have that case back in court within seven days they can only issue the ex parte order for seven days um and they can't decide whether to extend it unilaterally they have to bring people into court because of the implications of these kind of orders on people yes. whereas in the uk it's only drafted that they should bring cases back and only if it's contested so if you have a a, a naive litigator who's a respondent to one of these uh, and they just don't know maybe they don't speak the language properly or they they're so shocked and they don't get back and even if they do get back the courts are supposed to list the hearing but that's all they have to do they don't have to do anything at that hearing mm -hmm. and that's enough they call it a return hearing but they don't have to decide anything at that hearing yes. so what tends to happen is it just gets bounced on down the road and the non-molestation order stays in place yeah. and as soon as the non-molestation order is issued from the beginning that's the ticket for the legal aid money being taken by the uh, legal firms yeah. So the, the system that we have here and the manner in which things have been drafted, I mean, it's almost as if somebody who wanted to buck the system wrote the legislation. It really is. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, the way you're describing is certainly more the the uh, what we see from the Australian system as well. And in your presentation, I was absolutely amazed when you said the Israelis are required the matter to be back in court within seven days because I think the court process that's that's lightning speed. It's extraordinary. So yeah, of course they're a much smaller jurisdiction than we are here, but also if you are very serious about your um, family court system, um, there's less likelihood that it will be. Uh, worked by um, parents who are actually manipulate or professionals who are mm. manipulating the system. Mm. I will say as well that regardless of whatever um, domestic violence uh, um, provisions are in place in any law, where there is genuine threat to somebody, you can't do enough. Um, and I, I often feel here sometimes that uh, that where there is genuine threat on some of the cases I've, I've seen um, that even the draconian side of things ha hasn't been enough to protect somebody but the, the problem is that the, the 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 bucking of the system and the unnecessary application for so many of these I don't believe that the, that the tens hundreds of thousands of these non-molestation orders being issued ex parte every year is justified and that's backed up within the um, all of the forensic literature I've seen on false allegations in in, in in whatever jurisdiction the family court is being investigated, whether it be Australia or here, mm. I, and, in, and in America, all of the forensic research I've seen shows that uh, you know, most of the allegations, if they are actually adjudicated, do not uh, fulfil even the um, civil burden of proof. Mm. Seems well, to we me we do need to do something. We do need an investigatory team right at the beginning of any family court case, and I believe there should be a separate um, funding system for um, any lawyers that would be involved in that initial. Um, yeah. They should only get the funding ah. for the initial stuff, and then only if there is you know if if, if there is actually physical proof for it is very likely uh, should there be a separate set of funding for any further proceedings. I think yeah. that would, and there should be a very professional investigative team on the um, on the initial stuff.
Mm, straight so, yeah, no, that, I think that makes sense. Uh, we've got a uh, question, which I'll get to in a moment. But I just have one quick comment about, about uh, ex parte orders. It seems to me that in common law, and, I, and I'm no expert, but, but uh, I guess you could call me an amateur historian. I'm, I'm reading a lot about these things historically. And it seems that in common law, there was a real reluctance to issue ex parte orders for anything. And they get people before the courts. And it's, it seems to be within the last 50 years, the, 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 there's been an explosion of these, of these sorts of things in our legal system. They're just happy to, to throw them around. Yeah, and it doesn't seem to matter which uh, which party in the um, whether it's the mother or the father. And I've even had fathers phone me saying, "I want to get this, but I just don't think I will get it." Mm -hmm. uh, and they've needed help, literally taken by the hand through the court door, when they've been stabbed or when they've been, you know, even when um, the, there are medical records that the police haven't uh, the reports haven't been made to the police. But it's all over the guy's medical records about the, brute, the um, extensive and long-term injuries that they've had. They still don't believe they can get a non-molestation order. Um, some yeah. of them have seen have been in a real bad psychological state by the time that you know they've even sought help. They've sought help desperation, mm -hmm. um, having lived with it for years. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, you know, they get the non-molestation orders just the same. But again, I could make that could raise the cynical point that it's not always about protection, but the appropriation of all the business that goes with the normalization order. And because there are no real checks and balances on that side of things, it's a system that is obviously open to abuse. And that's, I think, the flip side of having a system that is designed to respond quickly and robustly to that kind of threat. But in my view, as I said before, I just don't think it goes far enough where there is proper threat. Mm. So I don't think it works both you know, both ways. I have yes. protection of, a, a, so of or protecting the system from manipulation. I don't think it works either way. So it's basically failing in protecting the innocent and failing to stop the guilty. Yes, I, I believe so. Yeah. 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 Okay. So it, We've got a question from Steve Moxon. I hope I pronounced that correctly. So, do you think the comprehensive injustice of the English family court system? Or bring its demise or is it just too big of a mess ever to be tackled might the cost to the taxpayers of abuse of a legal system to be a linchpin abusively laid be a linchpin. yeah it's it is an extremely good point i am involved as an advisor to what's probably the, the most effective attempt to reform the uh practice of the family cause within the current law so we don't have to change the law in order to improve practice because these laws never these improving laws never seem to get passed all the way through parliament um so we need to act within the current law mm. and um of course it would cost billions to mm. change the family court system what would we going to do with thousands of uh, what would then become unnecessary social workers, unnecessary lawyers, unnecessary judges, um, if we were to adopt the kind of system that is it in Israel. Um, how are we going to train people to the high standards that are necessary for this kind of work? Um, the, the entire move would be um, unprecedented, I think, in terms of any country making an industrial shift as, as big as deciding no longer to rely on coal mm. it's really that it, it's that much of a shift and no government i believe is really going to do that and to, it can't be tackled by piecemeal because every advance that you make in one particular area will be offset by the um, opportunities to undermine it with all when the rest of the system isn't working properly um, uh, I don't believe that the UK family court system, especially now that it's been separated from the High Court and from the Court of Appeal, there are two different, uh, you've now got the family division, which is the High Court above, and you've got the family court, which is circuit judges, district judges and magistrates. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't believe that the, the family court can effectively um, reform its practices. I, I, I can't see it happening. And it, it's, it would, there'd be a lot of, undoubtedly, a lot of resistance from within the system. All those people who you say would then be, be somewhat redundant or have to go at least find something else to do. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, I imagine there's a lot of money and a lot of influence within those people. They're, they're well-educated people. They're probably well-connected people. And it would be very, very difficult, I would imagine, to, to affect the change like that. Well, and they, and they can talk. You know, that's exactly the, the, the background that, that they have. They have been, they are extremely articulate and very well speaking people. But yeah. the problem with their, what they would say is that they have no evidence to back up any claims that they are actually working in the interest of children, that they are actually generally protecting the public rather than damaging the public. Mm. Um, so, uh, but the, the trouble is, as anyone that knows the family courts will know very well, was that everything runs on opinion and rhetoric. Um, facts are uh, often the first casualty of uh, many cases that go through the family courts. Mm. There was actually a study here done here in Australia, uh, um, and it related to negative consequences. The claim of the study was that there were negative consequences for young children spending time with fathers, so non-custodial fathers. And uh, this is—it's been absolutely debunked. But but many many years later, the, the, we still see lawyers and judges buying into this and just accepting it on face value and uh, depriving fathers of time with children as a result. And yet, this is just something that's. That's not true. Yeah. Um, of course, just because a child is spending time with a parent doesn't mean it's good time mm. for that child. Uh, what we should be doing is um, educating all parents to be sensitive parents and to be nurturing parents and to actually form secure attachments with their children so the children can, even in separated parents, can grow with healthy brain development. Um, and have all the wonderful outcomes that those children have compared to others. Um, so whilst there is the fact that not everybody is a great parent, mm. the trouble is we're not doing anything on the other side. You're supposed to identify a problem and then do something about it. There doesn't seem to be any motivation to do anything about the problem. They wish to maintain whatever problem is there so that they can amplify it and use it. Mm. Um, but of course, we're now getting MRI uh, brain, brain scans of children who have been brought up with two sensitive parents living together, two sensitive parents living apart, mm -hmm. one sensitive parent, and uh, one non-sensitive parent living together and different grades of sensitivity. And you can see the difference in children's brains, wow. Wow. see the difference in their cognitive performance is tied to their brain development and their life outcomes um, are tracked along that. And this is something we've only started to pick up on in the last few years, that we now have a scientific basis for what we've always known on an observational and longitudinal monitoring basis. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where we need to go, uh, I think, for debunking that particular um, argument. But it could be debunked on the observational literature that's been conducted in just about every jurisdiction all over the world with a, a massive expense and all of it coming up with pretty much the same results mm. that generally um, children fare far better when they do have um, contacts who, you know, meaningful contact, mm. which is more, seems to be around 40%, 30, 35, 40% at least with a separated parent, um, or you just build in problems for the future. Any less than that, you build, you build in problems for the future. Mm. So I've got this. Uh, Steve Moxon has made a quick comment, and then I do, do want to sort of carry along, carry on a little bit along those lines uh, uh, still. So Steve says, uh, "So could the whole system simply be closed down in its entirety, as this would be a massive improvement, even if nothing were put in its place?" Um, there are cases where the courts do some good. Um, I think what could happen instead of you'd have to replace it with something so uh and i think to start training highly specialized teams now that within six months they they could be operational okay in every local authority up and down the country so maybe 40 to 50 very well trained people um you only need another layer of training on top of what they have already um yeah, and, and let them deal with it 
to begin with all of the private law stuff should be dealt with in my opinion within the local authorities and not within private courts i'm not keen on the differentiation between private law and public if it's serious enough to affect a child's development um then it should be uh, well the trouble is we seem to split damage into immediate risk of harm and then it goes into a particular harm above a certain level then it goes into public law um but if it's long-term psychological damage which can be even worse um it goes to uh privately and i don't think we should have the differentiation we need certainly in this country we need child uh real child development specialists who have gone and qualified in something like attachment there aren't many of these attachment um, master's courses around the world i've done one here in the uk and people attend from all over the all over the world mm-hmm. so we need these kind of specialists with new uh skills that are um developed alongside the neuropsychology that's that, that's coming along uh and we need to form our teams and our practices around that sort of thing we'll have far less death deaths because many of the specialist interviews do spot the risk markers better than whatever system is currently being used um and it's as we saw with the death of a young child named Archie Spriggs in the UK mm-hmm. where he was murdered by his mother um on the day where it seemed she was likely to lose custody of him to his father uh, and that was a definite parental alienation case there so that there is because of the mental health um comparisons between um certainly parental alienation extreme gatekeeping and the um uh, public law side of things and risk children there we, we should be fusing this together and we need to be training uh specialists from the moment they enter university there should be a 5 6 year doctor degree uh, doctorate that somebody can start uh, around 18 years old finish it around 23 24 25 be a real useful specialist along the way um and have that kind of doctor in place for uh a mixture of private and public law i think the current uh, education that we have for psychologists just isn't good enough mm-hmm. and i think that there are too many psychologists within the working within the family system who whose techniques may work very well indeed for the forensic and clinical environments that they're mm-hmm. trained for but they don't work for assessing families mm-hmm. uh, at family courts whether it be private or public law and i don't think many of them actually have the integrity or the ability to realize or accept that their skills do not match what is what is required for, you know certainly for the more serious type of cases mm mm-hmm. So do you think uh, how long do you think it would I mean you you mentioned sort of the, there'd be PhDs or I imagine there's PhD going along uh for about a 5 to 6 year period uh but you you mentioned also you might have to get teams out within about 6 months so how long do you think a transition like that would take to to really get on the ground and working to making a difference Well with the um I mean, if you look at you compare it to something like the military so the all of the militaries had a big shock when um fair changed in around you know, the 2002 after afterwards and they had a choice of either pulling out of the war zones because of the you know uh, the, the damage that all they could change and all of them have managed to change and this is the military is small over the world have managed to make extreme changes to their uh, their practices their training and their equipment in order to be able to function within the environment the, the new kind of warfare the new and i don't think that there's any reason why um the social work profession and the psych- psychology profession the medical profession and the legal profession uh shouldn't be required to make the same changes i know in some of the units in the british army that if if somebody had managed to upgrade their training within a certain amount of time they were no longer required their, their services were no longer required right. and i don't believe that, this, that that we should um do anything less where children are involved especially mm-hmm. in a country recently where we've had a spate of parental murders mm-hmm. um all of which were with children who had long been on the radar of the social services mm-hmm. um and they're just missing the the the, the risk markers 
The prob trouble is that to train people to the high standards of some of the attachment courses that are coming out now takes a long time and it's an entirely different uh, perspective and practices to what's in place at the moment. And these courses are very intensive. Each interview, uh, there are five or six different types of interview for age-related uh, in interviews with children. They're highly specialized. They take about three weeks each of the time and then maybe another 18 months before you're really good at going out. And, and you'd have to do that with each particular interview. So you'd have some doing this, some do because you wouldn't be able to get one person who specialises in all of it, and then the ticket that you get only lasts a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, so, but this is the kind of specialism that we 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 need. Uh, but there's no reason why we couldn't get going with something that's good enough and certainly better than what we've got now, with 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 facilities of online training, um, with, with, with within six months. Yeah, I, I don't believe it. No, that's a, and that certainly would be would be promising results if they could if they could actually get something out within a period of time and, and and then you'd see a difference and that would spur people on hopefully to, to more change. So I want to go back uh, just to something we did talk about earlier. Um, just making sure there were no other additional questions no, from the audience. Um, I wanted to raise, and this we were you touched on this earlier, the the ten years doctrine. So I think it originates in, well, as far as I know, it originates in British law actually. But you mentioned that I think I think if I understood you correctly in the in the video, Israel is actually retaining that in its system. Is that is that right? Um, yes. So all things being equal, the mother will retain custody of a child under, I think, six years old in Israel. Um, I'm not so sure that that's such a bad thing. All things being equal, it goes to the mother. Um, at, in, you know, at least in the earlier years, where there is an imbalance and that where the child will be better off with the father, and that can be demonstrated at court, then that may or may not change, but depending on the degree of what that imbalance is. So, um, when we say Ten years doctrine has, has been maintained by them. It's not necessarily to an extreme kind of degree, and I think we do have a more extreme degree here in the UK. It's very unusual for uh, custody to be passed to a father here. If it is, it's after extensive litigation, certainly in private law and even in public law as well. It can take you know, it takes some you know degree of time. That, that I see even now that there is prejudice against uh, fathers remaining in some of the local authority practices, mm -hmm. even after the government has made it very clear that that kind of thing is needed to stop. And I was involved in a, a few seminars, I think about four years ago, where um, quite a few local authorities were looking for uh, advice from men's, group as, men's groups as to what kind of things their, 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 their members had suffered. Um, so I'm, I'm not particularly entirely against the 10 years doctrine. It shouldn't really have formed because Bobby well, did say that um, it's the more sensitive parent who should be the, be, be the main caregiver. But of course, most of his work was done with post-war uh, families where there wasn't a father. Uh, and the reason his work was doing it is because many of those children were going off rails without their fathers. Uh, and most of his work was with single mother families. But it doesn't mean to say that he necessarily um, espoused that in every case children must live with their mothers. It's just that that's been the political, uh, it's been taken up as a, a, as a political advantage. And unfortunately, much of these political influences have crept into the legal profession more and more over time, certainly inevitably creeping into the judiciary uh, and into the family courts. I think that probably even touches on a little bit what I, that I was going to raise, uh, but I'll, I'll go ahead anyway. Uh, in Australia, my understanding is that the 10 years doctrine was officially abolished sometime like in the 1970s or something, but it, but it seems to, to everybody that it continues. So in the UK, is it, is it an official policy still or is, that, uh, or is it just more, as you sort of suggest, a cultural thing that's still there, even though it's not officially endorsed? Yeah, I mean, just because something... Um is no longer endorsed, whether it be officially or unofficially. And then 
it suddenly uh, somebody says this isn't very good. It doesn't mean that the the practices that have developed up until that point are, are ever going to disappear. Um, so, uh, and personally, I can't see much evidence of it in the cases that I do because most of the cases I do around seven, eight years of age plus is where oh. indoctrination starts to creep in. Um, I wouldn't, I, I'm not, I haven't been called in for many um, earlier cases than that, apart from one where a child was alienated quite severely at the age of three. Uh, and it was, he was six by the time the court actually did anything about, did anything radical about it and tra transferred the child to the other parent. And that was a father that has alienated the child. Fathers can alienate children far quicker and with embed the alienation uh, far deeper, I think, than many mothers. Mm -hmm. uh, so to have a child alienated at that age, I think it would have to be really a father that, that did it, or a mother with assistance. You know, with someone you get a grandparent as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't really speak to whether I feel, in the cases that I've seen, mm -hmm. that there is a tender years doctrine. Certainly in my own case, um, there was a preference to keep the children with the mother regardless of the circumstances but i have to say that i did not myself at that point know enough about the law to have actually made an application for the children to live with me it may or may not have worked at that time so um yeah i i, I do get the opportunity to look through many case files mm -hmm. i see what previously happened mm -hmm. um and I think a lot of the reason why fathers don't get custody early is because of um, them not applying, they're not having the right legal advice, not knowing what to do. But what I do find is that the earlier you get into court, the more likely it is that you will have at least a shared care arrangement from the judge. They will issue those kind of things earlier mm -hmm. uh, in a children's lifespan than they, than they seem to be happy to do later on. That's um, an interesting point. Yeah, go on, sorry, go on. Yeah. No, that's, that's it, that's the end uh, of the point. No, that, yeah. that's a really interesting point. So really what you're saying there uh, to the men is that uh, they, they really need to move quickly on that if, uh, if they yeah. think that, yep, yeah. to get access to the, those orders. That's mm -hmm. really, yeah. One of the aspects, one of the unfortunate things about an adversarial system mm -hmm. is you have to get your, um, I don't like to say the word punches, maybe your jabs in mm -hmm. as early as possible in order to just maintain your position. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an unfortunate product of the adversarial system is that you, you have to make the right applications at the right time. You can't dilly dally. You have to be prepared to appeal. You mm -hmm. have to collect the evidence mm -hmm. all the time. You can't go into court on opinion and assertions. The evidence often is available if you have to record it or you have to get it from all the different agencies with all the subject acts of test requests under data protection laws and do them regularly because things may be going on that you don't know about. Mm. Um, I'd suggest every six months make these applications and get the information coming in. Um, maybe you'll find some something, maybe you won't, but at least if it's there, you'll have it. And that's from every agency that the child um, engages with. Mm. Uh, and that's how it is and the trouble is but because men uh well not just men but certainly women as well uh, they become so traumatized over this that the avoidance behaviors then start to develop and they don't get the evidence that's necessary because you know you can't have a life you can't get away from it but unfortunately the avoidance technique for trauma isn't available to people when you're family law is run within an adversarial system mm -hmm. you have to engage and you have to um, manage the damage to your system that, that that's that's significant damage that that's doing mm -hmm. you have to get a stress management and trauma management program in place so that you can keep fighting you can keep going so um i guess if i if i could summarize a little of a couple of key points there were uh, be prompt, and as you say, avoidance is a, 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 a serious problem there. 
but be informed too, I imagine. So mm. one, one area that, uh, that we uh, often see is a question over whether it's legal to record conversations or not. And of course, some jurisdictions a single party where as long as one party in the conversation knows it's being recorded, it's legal and can be submitted in evidence. And in some, in others, it is not. And even here within Australia, it varies by state. And oh, I, spent, yeah, I spent a lot of time encouraging uh, men who are the principal people who are, who are, in, who are in the groups we're talking to, to uh, be informed about what, whether they live in a one party or a two party recording state. And that of course mm. is, you know, has, has, has other implications as well across society. So it's a good thing to know whether you live in a one party or a two party state in general. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I when I was doing the um, legal advocacy work as a what's called a McKenzie friend over here, I, mm. I insisted mm. in some cases that the parents, whether it be mother or father, and they were picking up children with from the other one. Um, that they absolutely must wear body cam. Mm -hmm. If they didn't wear it, I didn't want to handle their case right. because there was no point going, dragging them back into court, getting all of the improvements only for an allegation or an incident, even a genuine incident to ruin things yeah. later on. And I found as well that as people wore body cam, their own demeanor, the, the way they came across mm. at these delicate points, improved as well because mm -hmm. they knew they were being really monitored themselves. Yes. so for everybody the only people who seem to object to them are the people who get caught out yeah. and the professionals who could no longer go into court asserting that something happened but have no evidence um so i was involved in a legal case here where um somebody recorded covertly recorded two professionals who would definitely collude this is a a social worker and a lawyer for the party on the other side who mm -hmm. were definitely colluding and misleading somebody uh, before they went into court um and that went to a uh, a hearing for contempt against them and at that hearing all of the previous evidence came up there's no um law in this country against recording but what happened in that particular case is that the judge refused to play the video even though it's a, it a public criminal trial refused to play the trip the video in court viewed it in her private chambers in the hotel and then came back next day and said i can't see anything and this was the case oh my god so, sorry Stuart, you just cut out there for a little bit okay yeah you, you can hear me now yes i can thank you yes yeah so even though you may collect your evidence the way it is treated certain types of evidence will you know may well be treated with more um contempt than others and uh, that father did not get to see his kids and the okay. half of the the evidence half of the judgment against them was um uh a bit more about the recording than him as a father yeah. um and that judge wanted to public publicize that judgment we appealed that, um, and we won that appeal in front of Sir James Mumby in the in in the Court of Appeal. Um, he didn't do it for he, he didn't. I think he sympathised with the father's case, but he um, he refused to publish the judgment on the basis that um, the lower judge had actually tried to insert guidance about covert recordings into his judgment and release it publicly, and he didn't have the level of rank to to do that because he had to be a high court judge to do that and he wasn't a high court judge mm. so i think sir james might be found a back door there to prevent the publication of this judgment and so we still have no real guidance and no real law over covert recording but there are many cases where it's been extremely useful and has kept people out of prison yeah well, thank you very much. We're actually starting to approach our deadline. So I think we should wrap up. I think we've had a fabulous discussion. There's a lot of material there. I think there's lots of useful information for people who are going through this process. Thank you very much, Stuart, for attending the Q&A. You're today. welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you for everybody yes. who is attending. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay.